Heavenly Father, please illuminate our minds and shine your light into our hearts as we read your word today. We pray, Lord, for um, an anointing as I preach, that you would um, see if there be any offensive way in me as I speak, that you would lead me in the way everlasting, that you would be the Lord by your Holy Spirit of our conversation and our contemplation of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I would like to actually uh, read a larger passage than that. I didn't want to overburden the volunteer reader. I'd like to read the entire chapter, John chapter 9, because it's all one story, and it's the next section in our discussion of uh, Jesus' famous I am the light of the world discourse. And the light of the world discourse ends with a bang, you could say, uh, with Jesus bringing sight to the man born blind. I want to read that entire story, John chapter 9, verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how are your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they again said to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man, the man answered, Well, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never 
Since the world began, has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind? If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, who is he, sir? that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. The word of the Lord. Amen. 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 What a great story. Oh my goodness. Uh, let me just give a, a couple of disclaimers before I start. Absolutely no way that I can possibly even scratch the surface of all that could be said about the story. That's what happens when you read 45 verses out of the gate uh, before you preach. So I'm going to set the bar low. I'm going to say, hopefully, some coherent things about this story. Hopefully, some true things. Hopefully, some provocative things that get us thinking about the gospel. But I will by no means be exhaustive. Um, the second disclaimer is that I am of a fairly philosophical turn of mind, as you know. And I tend to get stuck in the philosophical weeds. And this passage has a ton of fodder for philosophical contemplation. You can go in an apologetics direction very, very easily and get lost in the minutia of theology and philosophy and apologetics. And I would probably do that if left to my own devices. As a matter of fact, a lot of the stuff that I've prepared for this sermon, as I look at it in the last hour, just sort of getting ready, looks impossibly technical and abstruse and theological. And I think I'm probably going to junk all of that. So if it comes out a little incoherent, that's why, and that's a disclaimer. I, what I'd rather do is have this be relevant to where we live. Uh, but I do want to uh, begin by reminding you all of the psalm that we read at the beginning of the, of the service. Do you remember Psalm 36? Do you remember that great um, verse 9 from Psalm 36 that ends this way? In your light do we see light. Do you remember that? Do you guys know that verse? In your light do we see light. Have you ever thought about what that means? The philosophers and the apologists have great fun with this verse. They say, they conclude this because of that verse. It is only by the power and grace of God that we are able to make sense of the world around us. That we are able to reliably perceive anything. That we are able to see clearly or coherently anything at all. And the implication is that we cannot examine God to see whether he exists because it's only by the grace of God that we have the ability to examine if you see what I mean. right? We can't, for example, look at the scriptures and say, I wonder if the scriptures are the word of God and stand on some platform outside the scriptures and examine them and judge as to whether they are the word of God. Psalm 36, 9 says, it is God's inspiration, it's God's spirit, it's God's character that makes looking at the word of God even possible. And so it's a self-contradiction to stand up in your own mind and say, I'll be the judge of whether that's the word of God or not. I'll be the judge of what is true and what is false, what is good and what is evil, whether God exists and if so, what he's like. I will look to something in here or something in here to make those decisions. Psalm 36, 9 says, nope, that's not it. It's the God that you are putting in the dock, as C.S. Lewis put it, that gives you the ability to ask those questions in the first place. By, in your light, do we see light. What a great thought. I thought of it this morning as I was, as I was thinking about the sermon because Jesus talks about the fact that he is the light of the world here in John chapter 9, right? He says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Maybe even quoting in his own head, Psalm 36, 9. I bring light to this dark place. 
And maybe what I'm doing here is allowing the people in the room with me today to see light. Well, that's as much philosophizing as I want to do today. Here's the thing I want to talk about, really. Jesus comes along and sees a blind man, and his disciples look at him and say, whose sin is responsible for this blindness, right? Who sinned that this man was born blind? The man or his parents? And Jesus says, what we're all glad that he says, it's not anybody's sin. I've got a plan having to do with the work of God and the glory of God that's at work here. And is this a sufficient answer for the disciples? Is this a sufficient answer for the Pharisees? Is this a sufficient answer for the neighbors of the blind man? Evidently not, because the question of sin comes up eight more times in the chapter. There's verse 2, where it first begins, and then there's verse 16. The Pharisee says, hang on, hang on, hang on. How can this possibly have happened? This guy is a sinner. He's a Sabbath breaker, right? And then in verse 24, they say, we know this man is a sinner. And in verse 25, it comes up again. The blind man says, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but I used to be blind, and now I can see. And then in verse 31, the blind man says, look, we know that God doesn't have any dealings with sinners. He doesn't listen to them. And then the Pharisees in verse 34 to the blind man, you were born in utter sin. It's all about sin. And then Jesus even doubles down at the very end of the passage and says, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say you're, you can see, your sin remains. In other words, Jesus begins the passage by saying, this is not about sin. And then they pretty much talk about sin the rest of the time. <laughs> I think that's curious. There's a preoccupation it appears to me, on the part of everybody who's listening, maybe even Jesus himself, who mentions it twice, a preoccupation with the idea of sin. And in the case of the, of the Jews and the Pharisees and the disciples, the preoccupation seems to have these characteristics. First of all, an assumption that sin is the determining move in man's relationship with God. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that all these disaster was visited upon him, right? An assumption that, that sin is the thing that gets a relationship with God going. The first thing you do is sin, and then God responds, right? I would put it this way. There's this assumption that relational motion is Godward for the disciples and the Pharisees. Here's how you have a relationship with God. You do something usually bad. And then God responds to what you do, either with judgment or with grace or whatever. But you make the first move, you take the first swing. That's the first assumption in this preoccupation that appears to me. And the second one is that the sin we're talking about is some sort of behavior, some sort of ethical or moral problem, something that you commit, as in Sabbath-breaking. The Pharisees say, we know that this Jesus is a sinner because he did it on the Sabbath. He did something illegal and therefore is a sinner. And so there's this, this, this moral, ethical, legal worldview that seems to be swirling around this conversation surrounding the blind man that has to do with men sinning by behaving improperly and God responding with judgment. And maybe when we think about it, when we adopt these assumptions, we think, well, God's going to confound their expectations and he's going to respond with grace instead of judgment. Isn't that great? But I think what Jesus is doing in this passage is coming against those assumptions themselves. And this is why he says, I am the light of the world. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I am going to bring to this situation and to the minds and hearts of the people around here, illumination. I'm going to make something clear that wasn't clear before. I am going to make the blind see. And this is what I think he says. An extrapolation here. There's a philosophical reason for this, but I want to forget all of that. I just want to tell you this. Think about this. The thing that Jesus means when he says, I am the light of the world, is you guys can't actually see what sin really is. You can't actually see clearly your predicament with respect to sin 
And so you cannot be saved from it. And that's why I'm here. I am here as the light of the world to shine illumination and clarity and discernment into your darkened heart and give you eyes to see the nature of your sin and to save you from it. This is what I do as the light of the world. And this is a jump for me, I realize, because it looks for all the world like this is not a story about the guy's sin. It's a story about his eyeballs, right? He's blind from birth. And Jesus puts spit in dirt and makes mud and puts it on his eyes and he washes in Siloam and he comes back seeing with what organs? His physical eyes, right? This is a story about a physical healing. Except we, we can tell it's about more than that, can't we? Because of his last words to the Pharisees, right? If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say you see, your sin remains. I'm not talking about your physical eyeballs at all. You can all see. And as to that, how long did the physical healing of the guy's eyes last? Ever think about this before? How long before that guy's physical eyes closed again in death? I mean, how old was he? Blind from birth, he was presumably an adult, maybe he's 30. In the ancient world, maybe he lived to be 50. Because of lead, <laughs> bad water. Maybe 20 years, it's a healing last 20 years, and pretty soon, it's very, very temporary. I don't want to say anything against the faith healers, and I certainly don't want to downplay the glory and the joy of physical healing. Certainly don't want to downplay the fact that Jesus came to heal all of our diseases. But the diseases and the struggles that we face in this physical world are not the ultimate goal, not the ultimate reason that Jesus came to preach the gospel. Right? The signs and wonders that he performed were in the service of something greater and more lasting and more eternal. And when he comes to heal the blind man's eyes, we are on solid ground by saying, what does this mean in the spiritual plane? Bigger game is Jesus actually after here. And so I'm going to ask this question in that context. What is it that the blind man finally sees? What is it that the blind man finally sees? There's about five different places in this passage where he's mentioned as the guy who used to be blind, but now he can see. Verse 11, verse 15, verse 25, verse 37, over and over and over again throughout the chapter. He's the guy that used to be blind, but now he can see. If he's a symbol of Jesus coming as the light of the world to illumine what is dark and to preach the gospel to those who stumble in darkness, what is it that he sees? We have to guess because he doesn't say it out loud explicitly, but we have some clues. For example, he is held up in this passage as a contrast to the Pharisees by Jesus himself, right? This guy can see, you guys are blind. What's the distinction? In what sense can he see and they can't? What does he see that they cannot see? What does he say about himself? What does this guy say about himself? He only says one thing about himself. I used to be blind. I was blind. And now I see. I was blind. And now I see. What can he see now? This is a weird way to put it, but I want you to listen to me. This is the, this is the point I want to make. The thing he can see now, the thing the blind man can now see, is that he used to be blind. What he can now see is his blindness. The only way you know you're blind if you were born that way is if someone tells you, you know, you're blind. The rest of us have eyeballs to which you can only respond, what are those? I can feel them. What are they supposed to do? He has no idea of his blindness until Jesus comes along and heals him and now he sees. And at that moment, what does he see? What does he understand? I used to be blind. Oh, now I get it. I want to suggest to you, and again, this is an extrapolation or an interpolation or a guess, 
But that is a symbol for us, those of us who have been sighted all our lives, who do not struggle with physical blindness. That is a symbol for us of the blindness of the scribes and Pharisees that we do share, that everybody shares, a blindness to our own sin. The blind man sees exactly what the Pharisees cannot, that the only sin that matters in this world is claiming to be sighted. The only sin that matters in this world is denying blindness. I've been having a little experience with the Lord this week, where it feels like, and this is, you know, this is anecdotal, but it feels like the Lord has come alongside me and in a couple different ways suggested that there are things about my internal, personal life that are sinful in ways that I never even considered before. And it's not that I don't know the definition of sin in these particular cases. It's not that I couldn't list them and write them down and explain them. But the Lord has come along in a couple ways and said, and that's a sin you're guilty of. And where before I would have said, yes, of course, we're all guilty of that in one way or another, and I suppose I am too, technically speaking. There's been an experience or two in my life, this just last week, where the Lord has, has had it land in my heart. No, 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 you don't understand. You're guilty of that sin. That's you. And I've been given eyes to see my own urge to self-salvation in a particular way. That I, the, the only way I can say it is I didn't see that before. Did not see that before. I used to be blind to that. And would have said, before this little experience, I would have said that I saw. I would have said, yes, to seek the salvation of the self in that particular area <clears throat> is sinful. This is where it's condemned in the law, and those who pursue that are guilty in this way before the law. Thanks be to God for his grace that covers us in all areas. And everything that I would have said would have been true, I didn't see it as applying to me. And a there is a, a spiritual sense in which the Lord has come along and said, today is your day to see in a way that you did not see before. And, and I, I just want to I just want to stress that I share in my own experience recently uh, th this perspective of the Pharisees saying to Jesus, What do you mean? Are you saying that we're blind? In fact, at the beginning of this experience, I've said to the Lord, hey, wait a minute, are you saying that I've been blind to this? And Jesus in John 9 could have been speaking right to me. He could have, he could have been speaking right to me in verse 41. If you were blind, you would have no guilt. If you acknowledged your blindness, then in the moment where you saw and acknowledged your blindness, my grace would have covered it and you would have no guilt. My, your sin would have been washed away as white as snow in the instant that you realized you were guilty because of my grace and the overflowing, boundless love that I have for you. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. The greatest sin of which Jesus comes to free us all is not the sin of bad behavior. It's the sin of self-righteousness. Nobody denies sin. I mean, nobody's smart. We can all read the law, right? Nobody denies that they're a sinner. Raise your hand if you're a sinner. Oh, no. I already know. I know, you know, we all agree. We're sinners, right? <clears throat> it's denying blindness that is the real problem. The real problem is assuming, like the disciples assume at the beginning of chapter 9, assuming that sin is the first move in a relationship with God. That we act and God responds and that generally, generally our sin consists of some behavioral misstep. 
Except if we step back one second, we realize we're all making behavioral missteps all the time. We're going to continue making behavioral missteps all the time. And the blood of Jesus is either going to cleanse us from them or it isn't. It's a very simple equation. That's not the problem. All Christians, if you push them hard enough, will agree on that. The problem is, do our hearts see clearly just how desperate our situation is? Do you know the depth and the nature of the sin that Jesus is delivering you from? Better question, how can you know? How can you know? Because the blind man in John chapter 9 comes to know just exactly, I'm guessing, just exactly how deep his sin is and how desperate his situation is. He knows exactly after Jesus has dealt with him how he has been a sinner. And it's this way. He has assumed all his life that his decisions control the moral and ethical levers of the world. That God responds to his initiative in sin with either judgment or grace. That God takes his lead, takes his cue from the blind man. And it's even worse. The blind man has, looked, has assumed that he can look into his own heart. And this is what I want to drive home with you guys. That he can look into his own heart and know for sure what is there. How many times have you done it? I know what the law of God says, and I'm going to take a little inventory. I'm going to look inside my own heart. I'm going to see where are the places that I meet the law of God or that I fail the law of God. And I assume that my inventory, if I'm honest enough, can be reliable. That the evaluation that I conduct of the contents of my own heart is definitive and sufficient. That I myself am the proper judge of sin and righteousness. That I myself am the proper judge of truth and error, of right and wrong, of good and evil. That I can know anything reliably just by looking. And the assumption that inevitably follows all of those assumptions, if I do right, I will be blessed. And if I do evil, I will be rightly judged. What the blind man saw is that all of his assumptions about that amounted to mortal sin, the original sin, the only sin that matters. It's kind of like karma. It's kind of like a belief in karma. That's what karma is, right? The universe is keeping score. And in the end, because of the good spirit that lives in the universe and animates all things, the scales are finally going to balance. And everybody who's put their weight down on this side of the scale is going to, get, it's going to pop back up the level. And the universe is going to pay everyone back. And we Christians know better than to talk about a divine spirit that animates all things. And if we've done any reading at all, we've heard the word karma and thought about it or learned about it a little bit, we know that's some sort of Eastern religion and it's, not, it's godless and anti-Christian and we don't believe in karma. Except we do. We do. We just put a, the name Jehovah on it. And we say that God is divine karma and that when we act, God reacts in a reliable way. And the way we can be so sure that karma is active in the universe is that we're committed to the reliability of our own inventory. The reliability of what we see, of our perception of what we see when we look inside our own hearts. But the blind man, if he's a symbol of this spiritual situation that I'm talking about, gets delivered of all of that. Because that is blindness. And how is he delivered? How does he come to say, I used to be blind in my belief in karma. I used to be blind in my assumption that my senses were reliable, that I knew how bad a sinner I was. How is he delivered?
He's delivered when Jesus miraculously opens his eyes by divine power in a miracle. Could he have delivered himself of that blindness? I say no. It took Jesus coming along and saying, blind man, today is your day. Today you are going to learn more about yourself than you have managed to figure out in all of your years. Not only are your physical eyes going to be opened, but your spiritual eyes are going to be opened too. There's no such thing as karma, but there is such a thing as sin. And the chief sin of all, the original sin, the only sin that matters, is believing in karma. That's the one. Because it puts man's understanding of himself on the explanatory throne of the universe. When I came into this last week, bopping along in my life, taking a little moral and spiritual inventory every once in a while, generally the inventory was, you know, fair to middling. You know, better some days than others, but B plus. <laughs> B minus. I mean, better than a C. I've always been better than a C. <laughs> F. Oh my God. F. I had no idea. It's on. It's true. I had no idea. And, and, and what, what's different? Attitudes, behaviors, all the same. Understanding of the, of, the, of the law, the blessed, righteous law of God. Understanding of the gospel as it's given to us in the New Testament. All the same, nothing, none of that changed at all. Jesus came along and put spit on the ground and anointed my eyes and said, go wash in Siloam. And I came back seeing Not in such a way that I see everything and once I saw nothing, but you know, in a particular area, in a moment. There was this thing that I was blind about, and now I see. And the thing that I was delivered of, and I think that Jesus is talking about here, is blindness itself. Blindness itself. This is such a great, beautiful combination of a literal miracle, Jesus healing our infirmities in the flesh, and such a deep, symbolic, spiritual significance. Don't you think? We are sinners, yes. We are sinners. And Jesus came to die for all of our sin. Our sins of pride and arrogance and sloth and gluttony and lust and avarice and you name it. But maybe even at a deeper level than all of that. He came to, live, to deliver us from blindness. So that we would say what the blind man said when Jesus said, do you believe in the Son of Man? we said, say, where is he? That I may believe? I don't know what he looks like. <laughs> and Jesus said, Jesus said, oh, this is so good. Jesus says this, you have seen him. You have seen him. What he could have said is, he's the first thing you ever saw. He is the first thing you ever saw. You have seen him. He also could have said, you have been saved. You have been converted. You have been delivered. All of those things wrapped up in that one pithy, symbolic, and literal statement. You have seen him. And it is he that is speaking to you. And he says, Lord, I believe. And he fell down and worshiped. The thing about blindness as the original sin that underlies all of the other ones of sloth and lust and gluttony and avarice and wrath and all those other things. I love talking about it because it underscores the salvation economy so beautifully. Because it, because it leaves no room for anything except Jesus' deliverance. All that's necessary to be completely delivered and forgiven of blindness is for the Lord Jesus to give you eyes. What follows immediately upon being given your sight? Well, you fall down and worship. What, what's recently happened to me is I've said, oh my gosh, I, I could not see. 
Lord God, I repent, forgive me, flows out as fast as possible, flows out immediately. Because the grace that comes when the law comes in and convicts, the grace that comes is, is instantaneous. It comes at the same moment. It comes together with the conviction of sin. And this is why Jesus says at the end of chapter 9, For judgment I came into this world to wrap things up. I came in this world to wrap it all up and solve the problem. Put an end, a final judgment on the problem. For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see. Those whose original sin is blindness may see the depth of their need. Those who do not see may suddenly get a real inventory of the contents of their heart. Not some self-serving inventory based on half-knowledge and self-justification like the one we always do, but a real one. That those who do not see may be delivered of their blindness and see clearly. And that those who see may become blind. Does that sound like wrathful judgment to you? I'm going to save guys like the blind man, but I'm going to send to the outer darkness those Pharisees. I'm going to give, I'm going to heal the eyes of the blind man, but I'm going to gouge out the eyes of the other guys. Those who see may become blind. I don't think that's what he means at all. I think he's got a plan to save everybody. Because if a prerequisite to getting your sight is realizing that you're blind, maybe some of those Pharisees responded in chapter 9 like they did a few chapters ago in 7 or 6 or whatever it was and believed him. And you know what that belief would look like? Oh my goodness. I was blind. I'm blind. I see myself in my blindness even more clearly. I have come, Jesus says, as the light of the world to make clear to everyone the contents of their heart, real contents of their heart. Are we also blind, they say to him at the end of chapter 9? That's a rhetorical question, right? They say, what are you saying? We say we don't see the contents of our own hearts? Yes, of course that's what I'm saying. Thank you for listening. Thank you for paying attention to the miracle I just performed and it's never been performed ever once in the whole history of the world. Congratulations. But I have more to say to you. If you were blind, uh, praise the Lord, if you were blind in your own estimation, if you knew the depth of your own blindness, it would be the same as if I had already forgiven you because I have. If you were blind and you came to me and said, Lord, I'm blind. There, are, there is sin in my heart I don't even know about. You've got to save me. You would have no guilt because that only happens as a result of my miraculous work in your heart, which is grace, which is forgiveness, which is cleansing. If you were only self-consciously blind, you would have no guilt. There would be no sin to worry about anymore. The killer is saying that you see. The killer is saying, I know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, righteousness and sin in my own heart as it pertains to me. I know exactly how I'm doing. That's the killer, because it isn't true. My senses are not reliable. My senses are marred and bent because of original sin, and I will always, I will always see it wrong. Cornelius Van Til, the apologist, says, it's like a saw blade that's just a couple of degrees off, and it never, your, your, your mind, your senses, your, your decider, it never cuts a straight line. It's prejudiced. And there's no way to fix it. The only way to fix it is for the grace of God to give you a new saw blade. If you say we see, the guilt remains. So what do we do? What do we do? What, pray for a miracle? We put our trust in the Lord. Who says, not only I am the light of the world, but he says, I am going to prove it. <laughs> I'm going to prove it for you. I'm going to prove it to you. 
I'm going to give this guy here in the first century a temporary reprieve from his physical blindness. Not only to give him and you the hope that his eyes will someday physically open forever in the resurrection, but also to make a spiritual point. Your blindness is the thing I come to deliver you of as the light of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lord, I just pray that you would deliver me from blindness even today, that you would deliver all of us from that uh, self-sufficiency, from that assumption that we know when we look into our own hearts exactly what we find there. Even, Lord, when we're being as honest as we can be, Lord, I pray that you would deliver us from blindness so that you can deliver us from all sin. Thank you, Father, for your grace that seeks us out and pursues us, that comes to us to spit on the ground even when we don't ask. I pray that you would be faithful to shine your light into our hearts and illumine the dark, those dark places and give us eyes where we are blind. Lord, I pray that you'd be gentle in doing it. I have a good reason to believe that you are gentle. I pray that you would be, that you would be faithful. Save us from all our sins in Jesus' name. Amen.